Hello, folks and friends. This is Congressman Alvin E. Okonski from the 10th District of the State of Wisconsin. I'd like to come into your living room or your kitchen or wherever you might be and have a short visit with you, and I hope that you will permit me to come in. So grab whatever you're doing by way of a hobby. If you're a lady at a house, grab your knitting, and if you are the man at a house, light up your pipe and sit down and relax, and I hope that we'll have a nice, friendly, and informative visit. I'd like to talk to you today particularly about the farm situation and what is going on in the nation's capital pertaining to the farm problem. You know, we hear a lot about undeclared wars. And there are really two undeclared wars going on today, as far as the federal government is concerned. You all, of course, know about the undeclared war that is being waged by our government in Vietnam. I'm not going to talk about that undeclared war. I'm going to talk to you about un an undeclared war on our home front. And that is the undeclared war by this administration and the federal government on the dairy farmers of the United States of America. And it is an un undeclared war, and make no mistake about it, folks. Oh, yes, the undeclared war on the home front against the dairy farmers of our nation may not be as deadly as the undeclared war in Vietnam. But in the future, as far as economic consequences are concerned, it is going to be just as deadly. Now, I made a few notes over here of some of the highlights that I'd like to cover with you. The federal government, just the other day, I received a telephone call from a farmer friend of mine in northern Wisconsin. And after he got me on the phone, he says, Congressman Okonski, it looks like the federal government is dropping more bombs on the dairy farmers of the state of Wisconsin than it's dropping on Vietnam, and maybe that's why there is such a shortage of bombs. Of course, that's putting it pretty strongly. But when you consider what is happening on the national scene in Washington, D.C., that farmer was not very far from the truth. For example, Congress has been in session now approximately four months. And in that period of time, we've had a recommendation from the president to make a drastic cut in the school milk program. We've had a recommendation from the president that we make a drastic cut in the school lunch program. We had a recommendation from the president that we make a big cut in our EA fund that we make a cut in all of the farm research programs, that we make a deep cut in the soil conservation programs, that we make a cut in the farm administration program. We've also had the President of the United States asking the housewives to boycott the buying of butter, pork, and beef because the price is too high. We've also had the President and the Secretary of Defense stopping the purchase of butter, pork, and beef for the members of our armed forces. Then we've also had the stopping of the sale of hides for export, uh, which shuts out the foreign market as far as the hides are concerned, even to that extent. Then we've had a recommendation by the President that we increased the imports of cheese by some five million pounds. And then the biggest blockbuster of them all is coming by way of bombs. As if all these things don't hurt the dairy farmer enough, the real bomb will be coming in about two or three weeks. And that will be when the Congress of the United States is going to be asked by these same people who are dropping all these bombs on the dairy farmers, to pass a law that a farmer will have to pay his hired man more money than the farmer, his wife, and his entire family get all working together. And that will be 
the real blockbuster uh, by way of a bomb. Now, all this is going on at a time when the farmers of our nation, and particularly the dairy farmers, saw a ray of hope in the economic horizon. Things were beginning to pick up, not by anything that the government did, but by natural causes and by natural effects. And just as things were beginning to pick up a little bit, as far as a dairy farmer was concerned, entirely on their own, and then we get all these different edicts coming from Washington, D.C., which take away the effect of anything that came along naturally. And so the effect is going to be grave as far as the economic future is concerned, as far as the economic life of the dairy farmers of our nation are concerned, and particularly the dairy farmers of the state of Wisconsin, which is one of our largest industries in that state. Now, all this is going on in spite of the fact that for the past 10 years, we have seen ominous signs of dangers on the farm. From 1950 to 1960, for instance, 800,000 people a year. That's 8 million people from 1950 to 1960 left the farms of our nation and went to our larger cities and metropolitan areas, already overcrowded, already rampant with juvenile delinquency and relief, already rampant with defective housing, already rampant with, with defects in transportation. 800,000 people a year migrating from our farms to the cities from 1950 to 1960. Now, to give you an idea of what is happening lately, the Census Bureau and the Department of Agriculture just a few days ago released the census figures for our agricultural communities, our farm population, so to speak. And here is what was found. From 1960 to 1965, the trek from the farms to the cities has continued just as it has in the past 10 years from 1950 to 1960 even more so. For example, the recent figures just released show that although the population of the United States of America in the last five years has increased by 14 million, our farm population in the last five years has dwindled or been reduced by three and one half million. Just think of that. In other words, the trek from the farms to the cities is still continuing even at a higher pace than it did from 1950 to 1960. So much so, my friends, that the actual farm population of the United States of America today, believe it or not, is less than six and seven tenths percent of our entire population. In other words, our farm population today is only six and seven tenths of our entire population. That's what's been happening to our farms. And our farming population in the last 15 years. Now, that's a big drop. And it's continuing. It's continuing today. And with these blockbusters that are being dropped by the federal government on the dairy farmers of America, even now, I've had a dozen calls from farmers in northern Wisconsin saying that, that the situation now is worse than it ever was. And they're having auction sale after auction sale in each and every rural sector of the state of Wisconsin as a result of these latest bombs that have been dropped when the farmer had been waiting for a ray of hope, hoping that conditions would improve and get better, and they were, naturally, and then to have the federal government drop these blockbusters on them at this time, they've gotten to the point where they just cannot stand it any longer. And so, that's the situation as it exists today. The trek continues from the farms to the cities. And as a result, your cities are coming over to the federal government and asking for billions to help them with their transportation because their cities are overcrowded. They're asking for housing for for the poor because the cities are already overcrowded by the, 
to the tunes of billions of dollars. And so our tax structure is going to increase because as these people trek from our rural areas, from our farms to our cities, the problems there are going to multiply and the farmers who remain on the farms are going to pay the taxes in order to take care of this situation. Now, how come that this thing has happened? Well, it has happened primarily because of this trek of the farm families from the farms to the city. And because of the fact that the farm population now is less than six and seven tenths percent of the entire population of the United States, the farmers of our nation have gotten to be one of the smallest minority votes in existence in the United States. And under the various court decisions and reapportionment plans that had gone into effect in reapportionment of congressional districts, the metropolitan areas have taken over completely the reign and the control of the federal government. And because the farm population is so small, politically wise, this administration is making a play for the consumer vote, for the city vote, because the farm vote, as compared to all the other classes of votes in the United States of America, are relatively insignificant. And that's why this thing is going on. That's why the President of the United States went on the air and asked the housewife not to buy any butter because the price is too high, to boycott the, price, uh, the purchases of butter, pork, and beef because the price is too high. I think that the President of the United States would have performed a much greater service to the farmers of our nation if he told the truth about the high prices today. The prices that the consumer pays on the market today for butter, for pork, for cheese, and for beef are not due to the high prices paid to the farmer. The farmer is not responsible at all for this inflation of the goods that the consumer buys to eat. And to place the responsibility on the farmer is one of the most unwise and the most unjudicious statements that has ever been made, in my judgment, by a president of the United States. For example, in the last 15 years, my friends, in the last 15 years, I would say that the price of a loaf of bread has risen by almost 12 cents. In other words, you're paying about 12 cents a pound, uh, 12 cents a loaf, more for a loaf of bread today than you did 15 years ago. And yet, in spite of that 12 cent increase in a loaf of bread, the price that the farmer gets for the wheat that goes into that bread, that price of what the farmer gets is less than the farmer got 15 years ago. In other words, if the prices of a loaf of bread were based on what the farmer gets for his wheat, the, the consumer would be paying less for a loaf of bread today than they paid 15 years ago instead of 12 cents a loaf more than he paid 15 years ago. And the same thing might be said of beef and pork. Beef and pork are sky high. But the farmer is not responsible for the price. You'll find also that when the housewife buys a pound of pork or a pound of beef today, she's probably paying 40 to 50 cents more per pound than she paid, say, 10 years ago. But in spite of the fact that the housewife is paying that much more for a pound of pork and a pound of beef than what the farmer actually gets for the beef and the pork when he sells it is less today than it was 10 years ago. So if the prices were based on what the farmer gets, the housewife would actually be paying less for her beef and pork today than she paid 10 years ago. And so to blame the farmers of our nation for the fact that price is at the price that it is, the fact that beef and pork are at the price that they are, 
to blame the farmers of our nation for that situation is most unjustifiable and the biggest blockbuster that has ever been put upon the shoulders and the burdens of the farmers of our nation. Because they are the least responsible of any economic or social group in our country for the spiral of inflation that's going on in our nation today. I don't care what group you may consider. The farmers of your nation are the least responsible for the spiral of inflation that is going on in this nation today. Because they're actually getting less for their products today than they got 10 years ago. In spite of the fact that the housewife is paying much, much, much more for each and every product that goes, that farm products make up than she did 10 years ago. And I think that this ought to be of importance to the city folks and to the consumer. And I hope that you folks in the cities are, are listening to this because I think you should know that the farmers of our nation are not responsible for the high cost of food. The farmers of this nation are not responsible for this spiral of inflation that is affecting our country today. They are the only economic and social group that are getting less today than they got 10 years ago. And that fact ought to be known and it ought to be spread by word of mouth to each and every consumer, each and every working man because we should not punish the farmer for something over which they have absolutely no control. Now, what are the farmers, and particularly the dairy farmers of our nation, going to do about it? I was very disappointed when President Johnson made his recommendation that we import five million more pounds of cheese, and that's just the beginning. You see, folks, we have gone on so long giving away our money all over the world under our various foreign aid programs that we're pretty well running out of money. And money is harder to get and to come by, particularly with our already unbalanced budget. But because Congress has been more niggardly, and in my judgment, they should have been far more niggardly in handing out all these foreign aid programs. I've never voted for the program because I think it's demoralized the world and made us more enemy than friends throughout the world. But because this foreign aid program is running out of money and money is hard to come by, they have only one thing to do now, and that is to export our jobs. We've already exported our iron ore mining jobs. We don't have any in northern Wisconsin. They're all closed down. We're importing our iron ore from Liberia with mines built by United States dollars, taxpayers' dollars. We've closed down most of our plywood plants, and we're now importing our plywood from Japan. We gave them, under our foreign aid program, the most modern plywood-making equipment that uh, we could get our hands on. Uh, they can produce it cheaper. They have plywood uh, machinery that is the most modern in the world, given to them by us. And many of our plywood plants are still using machinery that's 40 and 50 years old, and they possibly cannot compete. We've given many of those jobs away. We've given many of our, our shoe manufacturing jobs away. Almost one-third of all the shoes bought in the United States of America are produced overseas. Uh, to give you an idea of what's going on, how many jobs, uh, shoemaking jobs, we have given away. And we have given away our, our pottery business. We have given away our watch business. Well, there isn't much left to give away. But we still have the farms of our nation to give away, and they're next in line. Now, I'm very happy that I never gave the President of the United States of America the automatic authority to lower and raise tariffs to import whatever he wants at his will. I've consistently voted against the Reciprocal Trade Agreement Act, which gave him that almost unlimited power. Because I saw this thing coming on from one industry to the next. And now that we've given so many of our industrial jobs away, we have only one thing left, and that is to give our farms away. And so now we're beginning to import more and more beef, more and more pork, more and more butter, more and more cheese. They're next in line. And incidentally, uh, I might as well be absolutely blunt about it. 
When the reciprocal trade agreement was up, I was criticized by some of the farm organizations because I didn't give the president the power to lower and raise tariffs to import anything that he wants at will. They thought that I should have voted to give him that power. Well, now I'm glad that I didn't because I proved to be right and these farm organizations that condemned me for voting as I did are proved to be wrong and I hope that they realize that they made their mistake. But the president under the reciprocal trade agreement does have that power and he's using that power and that power that he has doesn't expire for another two years, I believe, because the Congress of the United States gave him that power. Well, at any rate, in spite of the fact that he made the recommendation to the Tariff Commission that we import this additional cheese, I was very disappointed at the few farm organizations that showed up at the hearing at the Tariff Commission to protest this action. I believe that something like 12 members of Congress were over there at the hearing, including a statement that I presented. But outside of that, the protest wasn't as strong as it should have been. And why? Because unfortunately, the vast majority of the farmers of our nation don't even belong to any farm organization. They don't think enough of their welfare. They don't think enough of their future to belong. And consequently, the majority of the farmers in the United States of America do not have a voice. They're individualists. And they have no organization through which they can speak. They have no organization that can come to Washington and say, look, we represent the majority of the farmers in the United States. As a matter of fact, all of the organizations, farm organizations in the United States don't have a majority of farmers if you put them together, let alone one single organization having enough power and speaking for enough farmers in order to have their voice heard. But that's the difficulty because the majority of the farmers of the United States of America do not belong to any kind of a farm organization. They have no voice. They have no organization that can come over here and speak for them and protest when this sort of thing goes on. And that's one of the reasons why the farmers find themselves in the predicament in which they are. It's simply because they have not had enough force behind their organizations because there weren't enough members in these organizations so that they could come to Washington and say, look, we speak for the vast majority of the farmers of our nation. There is no one single organization representing farmers that can do that. In fact, all of, as I said before, all of them put together don't have enough members to do that. And so I think that it is high time that the farmers of our nation do little thinking and that they actually think along the lines of belonging to something of joining some kind of an organization so that they will have an, expect, an effective spokesman so that their voice can be heard. And if the farmers of our nation today, if I'd say if 75% of the farmers of our nation, the vast majority of them, would go out in the next few weeks and join some farm organization that could be their effective spokesman and those organizations came down here, I'm sure that you'd get results because seemingly our federal government today has gotten so complicated and so intricate that you cannot get anything from your federal government unless you march on Washington, unless you protest, or unless you strike, or unless you do use some kind of an economic force in order to get what you want. The farmers of our nation are gentle people. They are peaceful people who, who generally don't believe in that sort of thing. But you're living in a condition now and in a world today where everything, practically everything, is accomplished by pressure groups. And unless the farmers of our nation are knit together in a well-organized union or farm organization of some kind so that they can come over here and speak with authority and say, look, we represent this many farmers which altogether represent the vast majority of the farmers this is what we think ought to be done, you get results. But we will not get them with the helter-skelter situation that we have among the farm population in our land today. And so, there are many other things I'd like to talk to you about, but the time is getting short. Uh, and I have to keep this within a time limitation, otherwise the 
the uh, uh, television station will not run the program, the particular station that this program is on. And because there is a time factor and a time limit that has to be adhered to, I must draw my remarks to a close. And I just want to say this to my good farm friends, that you better organize. You better start protesting. You better start kicking up a little fuss. Because if you don't, these blockbusters that are being dropped by your federal government on your overburdened backs today are going to continue to come one after another until pretty soon there'll be no farms left in the United States of America. And that will be the saddest day, not only for the people, but it'll be the saddest day for freedom. It'll be the saddest day for every single group that's existing in our country today. If the farmers go by the board, the government of the United States and the people of the United States are going to rue the day that that happened and that they sat idly by while it was happening. And so, Thank you very much for permitting me to come into your living room, your kitchen, or your dining room, wherever you are, and permitting me to visit with you for this short period of time. I hope I've given you some information that's informative, and I hope, particularly, that I've done something to save the family farms of this great nation of ours. Thank you, and God bless you.